I'm going to read Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9. Listen, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These words that I'm giving you today are to be in your heart. Repeat them to your children. Talk about them when you sit in your house and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Bind them as a sign on your hand and let them be a symbol on your forehead. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your city gates. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, Don't worry that I've just put the Bible aside. I've got my own Bible up here marked with the passages and we're going to cover a a number of passages today. We're going to do a bit of Bible hopping uh, because we're covering a fair chunk. If you don't keep up and you'd like the references, let me know and I'll give them to you afterwards. But I'll read through most of them as we work through this passage. Uh, I love the Lord of the Rings. Uh, We're up to uh, the fourth time reading all of them with our kids and I've read them a couple of times beforehand. Uh, There are many days where I feel like Bilbo Baggins spread a little thin, like butter on toast. Isn't that a great phrase? Uh, And I was really excited when the movies came out. Uh, I was really eager to see how they did. And let me tell you, even though I think they're probably dated pretty quickly, uh, I reckon those movies did a great job of actually whacking in a whole lot of stuff uh, in the movies, but there were some scenes they left out, weren't there? Uh, if you know the Lord of the Rings, uh, I scratch my head. There's a bloke called Tom Bombadil. I just, why, how could you leave Tom Bombadil out? You'll have to go and read the book and find out about him now. But when you cover all those books in one movie, if you don't want the movie to be 24 hours long, you're going to have to leave some things out. You got to go in big brush strokes and leave out some little things. We're doing some big brush strokes this week and next week. There are some things we'll not talk about as we cover over a thousand years of history. We're going to uh, go from mountaintop to mountaintop because we're trying to cover a large part, in fact, the majority of the Old Testament in two sermons. If you think about it, we've spent three weeks doing 12 chapters. We're going to spend two weeks doing most of the Old Testament. We're going to jump from mountaintop to mountaintop But I want you to remember what we're doing. We're trying to look at a big picture, what God is doing across history. That's what we've been doing over the last few weeks, looking at God's big picture. Remember the big picture is God's kingdom, which is God's people in God's place under God's rule and blessing with his word. We saw what that looked like right at the beginning. God's people were Adam and Eve. The place was the Garden of Eden. His clear blessing was, I give you all this, just don't eat from that tree. And then we saw how that perished. Remember, Neil talked to us about that two weeks ago. We saw how Adam and Eve said, actually, we know better than you, God. We can do a better job. And so God's people were kicked out under judgment. The place was lost and they weren't under blessing, they were under curse. We saw last week that God in his mercy has always had how many plans? Plan A, one plan, my kingdom. And to Abram, he makes a promise that through Abram's family, he'll bring his people back into God's place, which at this time will be Canaan, under God's rule and blessing, so they bring bring blessing to the world. And this sermon and next week, we're going to do broad brushstrokes to see how that starts to come about. Let me just give you a brief picture. This week, Genesis 12, Exodus 18, we're going to look at God's people. Exodus 20, the whole book of Leviticus, we're going to look at God's word. Next week, Numbers through to Joshua, what it looks like to go into the land. And Judges through all of 1, 2 Kings, all of 1, 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Chronicles, what it looks like to have something new, a king. So I'm not going to cover all of our favorite stories, am I? But I am going to follow that big picture, mountaintop to mountaintop, looking at God's commitment this week, people and blessing. I know when I put this sermon together, I prayed a lot. 
So how about I pray as we try to cover a thousand years in 25 minutes? Dear God, thanks for your word. You are, you are timeless. You are eternal. And so is your word because it reveals your nature and character in the events of this world. Father, we're sitting here hot and sticky, maybe distracted with burdens on our heart or things that we're preparing for. Father, over these next few minutes, please still our hearts, please remove distraction from us, and please help us to delight as you bring your promise to fulfilment over many years. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm at point two on the outline. I listen again to God's promise to Abram, Genesis 12. Go out from your land, your relatives, your father's house to the land I'll show you. I'll make you into a great nation. I'll bless you. I'll make your name great. You'll be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you. I'll curse those who treat you with contempt. All the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Fairly clear promise. You're going to have a really big family, Abram. A really big family and you're going to have your own piece of territory. A couple of problems though, aren't there? There aren't many kind of birth promises made to a 75-year-old male. Many of us breathe a sigh of relief at that, don't we? But that's Abram's age at this point. Not only that, but he's being told that he's going to have a great family and he's going to enjoy that by leaving his family. That's a bit of a problem, isn't it? And he doesn't even actually have his own land anymore. There are some significant roadblocks, aren't there, to God doing this promise, and yet God persists, doesn't he? Genesis 15, verse 5, Genesis 17, 6 to 7, Abram, let me show you the stars. Go and count the sand. That's the number of your family. Abram says, I take you at your word, God. I trust you. God gives him a new name, Abraham, father of the nations. Abraham, in his wisdom, after about two decades, decides to take matters into his own hands, doesn't he? Because God's obviously not going to do the job for him. So like any good male, he decides to just do the job. He sleeps with his concubine. They produce a son, Ishmael. Hey, God, look how well I've done. What a disaster. He's not a pin-up boy for obedience, is he? Or faithfulness. He's fallible like every other human being. What does God do? Well, God persists, doesn't he? He's faithful. Sarah has a son. The son's name is Isaac, which means laughter, largely because she laughed at God's promise. And then she laughed in delight when the boy came. Out of that family, God says, I will bring my plans to fulfillment. The promise passes to Isaac. And then God seems to do something really strange. He says to Abraham, hey, Abraham, I want you to take this one and only boy who will be the father of this humongous nation. I want you to take him up on that hilltop and I want you to sacrifice him. Now, barbaric. I mean, what kind of God is an Indian giver like that? He says, here's your boy, and then I want him back. What does Abraham do? He takes God at his word, doesn't he? Like he did in Genesis 15, verse 6. So he walks, he takes his boy, and the boy carries the wood to the top of the hill. He lays his boy down, and he raises the knife, and God steps in. Uh, you can talk about that in any number of ways, a bizarre kind of test, a display of Abraham's growth in faith, but at least this is there. God continues to do what he promises, doesn't he? Because at that last moment, God says, Abraham, why don't you take that ram in the bush over there and sacrifice the ram, that substitute? And so Isaac marries. He has two boys. Esau and Jacob, they're twins. Esau is red-haired and hairy. He loves the outdoors. Jacob, no red hair, not as hairy, loves the indoors. And God decides to pass it on to the one we would pick, doesn't he? That promise. Because I'd certainly pick Esau because you want a bloke who likes the outdoors to lead your nation. 
Now God chooses Jacob, doesn't he? And the promise passes to Jacob. He gets it in a really clear and and open, trustworthy manner, doesn't he? That promise. He lies, he connives, he runs away. He's just like his grandfather Abraham, isn't he? So who's doing this? Well, it's certainly not the humans, is it? It's the God who's committed. Well, Jacob has 12 sons. It's not always happy families, is it, Jacob's family? And among those sons is one he loves more than the others. His name is Joseph. In fact, to make sure he knows all the other 11 know he loves him, he gives him a really special jacket. That's a way to bring family unity, isn't it? And he sends him to visit his brothers in the paddy. And they beat him. And they throw him in a well. And then they sell their hated brother for silver and say he is dead. And he goes into slavery in Egypt. Ah, his life's full of twists and turns. He moves from the feather duster to the rooster, doesn't he? He moves from the poorhouse to the penthouse and becomes the prime minister of Egypt. And at the height of one of the greatest famines of all time, who rocks up at his door? Those brothers who'd rejected him and beaten him and passed his death off. And they seek food. And what does Joseph do? He gives them what they knew. He provides for them. And so the whole family, 70 of them, arrive and settle in Egypt. And Jacob meets his boy, the one he thought was gone. Jacob dies. Can you imagine what the brothers are thinking at this point? And they're fearful for their future. And Joseph says to them in Genesis 50, verse 19, Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You planned evil against me. God planned it for good to bring about the present result, the survival of many people. Therefore, don't be afraid. The humans deserve all this, don't they? No, of course they don't. God is intervening. God is working out things in line with his promise. God is committed in a way that the humans do not deserve. Now, we need to pause at this point and actually consider the state of Abraham's family. It's a pretty large family at this point. They're 70 in number. That's a big family gathering, isn't it? 70. It's hardly the same number as the stars and the sand, is it? it? It's not a great nation. And have you noticed that they're no longer in Canaan? In the land God promised, where are they? They're in Egypt. These plans just seem to hit roadblock after roadblock, don't they? This plan A of God. But let me remind you from Genesis 15 what God had said to Abram. Then the Lord said to Abram, Know this for certain. Your offspring will be strangers in a land that does not belong to them. They'll be enslaved and oppressed 400 years. However, I will judge the nation they serve. And afterwards they will go out with many possessions. God told them, well told Abraham what he would do. And lo and behold, we find God's people at the start of Exodus where? In a land not their own, enslaved to the Egyptians, and they cry out to God, they cry for his mercy. What does God do? He hears them, doesn't he? He remembers his promises. He chooses a man named Moses. He saves him. He meets him. Do you remember that story where he meets him at that burning bush? He shares his name with him. I am who I am. I have no rival. If you want to know me, listen to my words and look at my actions. I am who I am. And what am I going to do, Moses? Exodus chapter 6, verse 2. Then God spoke to Moses, telling him, I am Yahweh. I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as God Almighty, but I did not make my name Yahweh known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land they lived in as foreigners. 
Furthermore, I've heard the groaning of the Israelites whom the Egyptians are forcing to work as slaves. I have remembered my covenant. Therefore tell the Israelites, I am Yahweh. I will deliver you from the forced labor of the Egyptians. I will free you from slavery to them. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and great acts of judgment. I will take you as my people and I will be your God. God's committed. He rescues them. Neil touched on that rescue in a series of plagues. Those plagues lead to the humiliation of Egypt. If it was modern day newspapers, it would say Egypt reduced to economic basket case because that's what God does. Egyptian gods exposed as impotent because that's what God does. And then there's the 10th plague. Remember we celebrated that last year on the front lawn, the Passover. And God says that on a certain night, I will send my angel of death and he will pass over the land and he will take every firstborn from the palace to the poorhouse. But if you kill the lamb and if you put the blood on the doorpost, Abraham's family, I will pass over your homes and your firstborn will live. The lamb dies instead of the firstborn. The blood is a sign so that God passes over. It's an event remembered for the rest of their time as this substitute stands in. God leads them out. He leads them to the edge of the Red Sea, panic stations, Egypt's coming. God saves them again, wipes out the Egyptian army in his power and strength. How many are they now? Remember 70 moved to Egypt 400 years before? We're told that they've got at least 600,000 soldiers. Now that is a big family. That's almost a great nation. And what are they taking with them out of Egypt? All the wealth. Exactly like God said in Genesis 15. 400 years beforehand. And God brings them out and he takes them to a particular place. Where does he take them? He takes them to Mount Sinai, doesn't he? Now, God's had a meeting there before, hasn't he? That's where he met Moses in the bush. And he brings them back there. And the reading that we had from Emily tells us what he does. Exodus 19 verse 3. Moses went up the mountain to God and the Lord called to him from the mountain. This is what you must say to the house of Jacob. Explain to the Israelites. You've seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to me. Now if you listen to me and carefully keep my covenant, you'll be my own possession out of all the peoples, although all the earth is mine. You'll be my kingdom of priests, my holy nation. These are the words you are to say to the Israelites. And when they hear them, they say, we will do everything we've been commanded. That's Federation Day, Independence Day, whatever day you want to call it. That's the day they become a nation. God enters into a solemn and binding agreement with them. I have saved you. I have made you. You are mine and you now show me to the world. You are God's people. On the one hand, that's a great fulfillment. Probably more than a million people made the people of God, saved by God. It's hardly the number of pieces of sand on the seashore though, is it? It's certainly not the number of stars in the sky. They're not innumerable. They're not in a land. They're certainly not blessed. They're wandering around a desert. But it's a signpost, isn't it? A signpost. Which brings us to the next part, point three on your outline. Our world's got a fairly dim view of God, doesn't it? Our world doesn't like God. I don't think I'm saying anything radical in that. I think as our world looks at God, the key issue is I don't want someone to be my boss. I don't trust God to actually look after me the way he promises. In fact, I think I can do a better job than God. And that leads to the next point where people then say, I don't like God's rules. We don't like rules, do we? 
because we don't like someone telling us what to do. The ironic thing is that as you drove to church today, God willing, you obeyed a whole lot of rules, didn't you? How contradictory we are. (laughs) How contradictory. God's rule is actually good. In fact, when God's rules are ignored, what happens? Things get broken, don't they? I'll hazard a guess and say that you've experienced that this week, haven't you? Some brokenness. Even if it's just the fact that it's far more humid than it should be. The world doesn't work the way it should. We know what happens when humans say they can do a better job than God. And so when God brings his people out of slavery to freedom, he wants them to know life. And so he gives them his rule. Exodus chapter 20, better known as the Ten Commandments. He then unpacks it in a lawyer's handbook in the rest of Exodus, Leviticus and Numbers. God gives them his rule and he unpacks it for them. But we've got to notice this very important fact. I'm going to ask you a question. I reckon it's one of the most important questions you'll get about the Bible. Listen carefully. Do the Ten Commandments come before or after God saves his people? They come after, don't they? Do you know what? It's such an important question and we get it so wrong, don't we? Because often we think we've got to do the Ten Commandments to get saved. Did you notice the history? I'm going to save you And then I'll give you the Ten Commandments. So the Ten Commandments have got nothing to do with us getting right with God. Instead, they've got everything to do with us showing what God has done. That God has saved us. That God has given us this thing that we don't deserve. They are a response, not a to-do list. You could phrase it another way. The Ten Commandments are the way in which God helps his people know who he is. Do you notice how the Ten Commandments start in Exodus 20? I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the place of slavery. Now let me tell you who I am. So you can do the job of showing me to the world. So you can show the world how unique I am. So you can show the world what it's like to be back with me. Remember God says in Leviticus chapter 11, I'm holy, so you're meant to be holy. Put literally, I'm unique, so you're meant to be unique. So when you look at the Ten Commandments, there's a temptation to divide them up into categories, isn't there? Oh, these five go this way and these five go that. L- let me encourage you, keep them as a unit because that's the character of God. One unit, one nature, one God. And so when you go through them, when you read them, you'll see the revelation of God. God is so generous, you don't need to covet. God is so generous, you don't need to steal. God is so committed that you keep your promises of marriage. They reveal the character and nature of God. And as God gives these commandments to his people, he expresses his deep desire, doesn't he? He expresses his deep desire that he can live with them. They're a great people. They have his word to rule their life. And he says, I want to dwell with you. Exodus chapter 25, verse 8. Exodus chapter 25, verse 8. They are to make a sanctuary for me so that I may dwell among them. You must make it according to all that I show you, the design of the tabernacle or tent, as well as the design of all its furnishings. Yeah, If they make that tent, it's almost like the Garden of Eden, isn't it? God's people dwelling with God under God's revelation and word, except there's this one little fly in the ointment. What's that fly called? Sin. Sin. You see, us humans say, I don't want you in my tent, God. Uh, This tent's for me, not for you. 
And God says, no worries. You don't have to have me in your tent. But if you reject the author of life, you've willingly took death. That's a significant problem for two people to live together, isn't it? Sin. And what does God do? Well, God actually steps in yet again and says, here's a system to remind you. What's it? It's the system of sacrifices, isn't it? We've already seen that. Take the best of your flock, the prime breeding animal, the one with the genes you want to preserve, and you sacrifice that to me. It takes your judgment instead of you. It dies instead of you. It faces my anger instead of you. How how often do they do that? Well, at least every year, more often than not, every week, do they? So again, it's partial, isn't it? It's a signpost in history to say, this is how serious sin is for the people of God. It's a signpost saying, look forward. There are bigger days coming. So when we get to point four, the so what, we've got a partially great nation and we've got a partial rule and blessing with a sacrificial system. What are we to do with it? Well, one way to deal with it is to go, well, ancient history, really. I'm just going to get on with today. To treat it as a dusty little document that has no relevance. Well, let me ask you, why are you here today? Because the fact that you are here tells me you think more than that. And so let me suggest three ideas. The first is this. This reveals the character of God. Let me quote someone. The Bible does not just tell the story of God's work of salvation. At the same time, it reveals God's character. When you look at God's words and God's deeds, who do you meet? God. That's why his name is I am who I am. If you want to know me, listen to me and watch me. Listen to me and watch me. And you'll learn much about the character of God. When Abraham says, God, I'll take matters into my own hands, God is faithful. When God's people are in a mess, who always steps in alone to save? God. When you look at the characters of all those people God uses, it's not the people but the mercy of God which is sufficient. When you wonder at what God has done in Egypt, you realise that his ways are beyond our comprehension. When you notice the way he deals with sin, you notice that he is always just and fair. And you come to the conclusion that there is no rival to God. It's partial. But all those road signs say God is the most significant. Which leads to the next point. It's a partial fulfilment. I was reading an article by an ordained Anglican clergy person this week who said it is hard to deny that God is a failure when you read how his promises fail in the Old Testament. That's one way to read the Old Testament, isn't it? Oh, God never got there in the end, did he? I mean, Israel, not innumerable. Not dwelling with God. You know, by the end, look how barbaric they are. That's one way to read the Old Testament, isn't it? A million people in the desert, that's not the whole world blessed. A tent, as if God could dwell in that. Lamb sacrifices each week, well, human sin's still an issue. God's failed. I I suspect that if you read it carefully, you'll see it not as failure, but as faithfulness, won't you? The fact that God is hammering down road signs on the map of history in the geography of our planet saying, look, I am doing what I promised and greater things are coming. Look at the nation, 70 to over a million. What will they be? Look at my words spoken freely in stone. Imagine what it might be. I want to dwell with you. Look at that tent. That's a reminder of my desire. So there's a movement there. And as we see the movement, The third idea, there are patterns. 
patterns we need to notice, patterns that we need to pay attention to. The pattern of how God deals with sin, does he make humans come to him or does he go to them? Every time he goes to them, doesn't he? God comes to the rebels. The pattern of a single beloved son climbing a hill, carrying the wood upon which he'll be sacrificed, does that sound familiar? Showing the promise of God. The pattern of a beloved son who's hated by his kith and kin and so beaten and sold for silver and left for dead. Does that sound familiar? Except God works it for good. The pattern of God putting on a tent to dwell with his people, just as John tells us in John 1 that Jesus comes in a tent to live with his people. The pattern of the sacrifice of the most perfect creature for the most imperfect creatures so that God passes over because of the blood. Do you notice those patterns? The patterns of the fulfilment of the promise of God. The fulfilment here is about God. It's partial, yes, but the patterns are established and as we open the word of God, we will see that God is, I am who I am and I will do what I promised. Let me pray. Dear God, thanks for your word. Thank you that you are committed. Thank you that you work your promises for our benefit. Father, these are not dusty, but they are things to delight in. Help us to delight in them today. Amen. Any quick questions? Pete won. Yep. All right, so Pete asked from the Deuteronomy reading, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength and mind. What does that look like? Can you distinguish it? I think first and foremost that one saying comes from the verse just above. What's what's the verse just above? The Lord our God is one. So he gets everything. There is a wholeness about it. So I think that's the first point of call. I think it's covering secondly every aspect of your nature. And so what you will desire and do. And I think thirdly, it then helps us go to the New Testament because when you think about it, uh, for example, who should I pay taxes to? Remember that question Jesus gets? How does he respond? Can anyone remember? Grabs a coin, doesn't he? And he says, look at the image on the coin. Whose image is on the coin? So you put that to Caesar. Whose image do you bear? So put that to God. God gets all of you because you bear his image. He gets your heart, your soul, your strength, your mind, everything. And so really Christians have a very simple priority list. There's only one, God. And then in each aspect of life we work out what that looks like. So it's not God first, X second, someone else third. It's one. It's a really simple list, isn't it? One, dot. God, he gets all of me. So I think those are the three ideas that are in there, but if that's not clear, come and buy me up over one of Ray's pulled lamb burgers later on.